OK, so we were doing these line broadening uh, mechanisms last time, and today we want to finish that. So there is something called natural broadening, which gives rise to this Lorenzian profile, and we did this oscillator model with damping due to um, radiation reaction force, and it gives rise to these long tails uh, due to this Lorenzian. At large nu, this becomes one by nu squared, which is a Lorenzian tail. Whereas if you have Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities, and if the line is taken as a delta function, then you get a Gaussian distribution of the line profile, which sort of re reflects the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the particles. Right, and the difference between the the Gaussian and the Lorenzian is that the Lorenzian does not fall off as quickly at large frequencies, uh, whereas exponential or the Gaussian really becomes very small beyond a few nu minus nu naught, or uh, beyond a few uh, delta nu, which corresponds to the the thermal velocity. Right, so this is the width of the Gaussian here. Um, so then we talked about this uh, cross section uh, of the line or the op opacity uh, of the line, which is proportional to the B coefficient. And is given by this. So, you know, this is the value of cross section at the peak frequency. And it's given by, you know, this standard expression that we encountered some time ago when we did Einstein's A and B and wrote alpha, the absorption coefficient in terms of Bs, the microscopic Einstein coefficients. Um, so, this is the line center. Uh, cross section given in terms of atomic physics uh, variables like the oscillator strength of the transition which has one to one relation to with b12 but you know it's traditionally used in the spectroscopy literature um, and you see this is the cross section uh, 10 to the minus 14 centimeters squared uh, And this is how it depends on the temperature. Right, an interesting thing to note is that compare this with the Thompson scattering cross section, which was 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 25, right? So lines are very, very strong. If you have atoms in the gas, they are much better at absorbing than free electrons. This is what this means. Okay, and at the, in the end, we talked about if you have turbulence in addition to thermal velocity, then the turbulent velocity and the random thermal velocity add in quadrature like this. So your observed width of the line, the observed Gaussian width is related to both the thermal uh, temperature and the turbulent uh, width of, you know, the, the, the turbulent velocity uh, spread given by this expression. So, um, you know, this can give us a hint of what the turbulent velocity is uh, in uh, in some plasma where we are able to measure the lines. Okay. Uh, sorry. So now we will actually talk about, you know, other broadening mechanisms. Uh, and, you know, and in the end, I'll actually talk about some applications. So we talked about natural broadening, which gives rise to uh, Lorenzian 
line profile. Now we can actually talk about uh, something called collisional broadening. So, so if you have a if you have an atom which is sort of you know producing uh, light or electric field, this is like electric field as a function of time, and you know the atomic transitions are very sharp. So this is very very pure sinusoidal. Of course, not perfect because there is always. Uh, I mean, this is this can never be a delta function. There is always a width uh, associated with this, uh, with the pulses that you get, and that corresponds to a bandwidth in frequency space delta omega. Okay. Now, if you have collisions, what happens is, uh, so you have an atom which is sort of uh, emitting uh, this electric field because of. Uh, these line transition, right? Now, if you have a collision, what happens is suddenly the phase of this uh, emission changes. Uh, so you have something like, uh, so basically you have something like you have like a nice sinusoidal variation and then you have a collision and you know, you, you basically have a random phase oscillation again with the same frequency, but with these uh, jumps uh, which introduce random phase after some time, right? So T collision, uh, which is one by new collision. The new is the collision frequency. So every this, you know, you know, this is not a fixed time. There is a distribution. So that there is a distribution uh, of uh, kick times uh, and it actually can be approximated well by a Poisson distribution. So this is e to the minus collision frequency times delta T. So it, it's proportional to this. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, this is the probability distribution of delta T time between two collisions. So if the time between two, you know, uh, time between two collisions, which is much bigger than new C, is very, very rare. So, you know, you have collisions uh, which happen frequently over a time scale between zero and uh, T collision, but they become very, very rare uh, beyond that. So, this is a Poisson distribution uh, of collision times. Now, if your electric field, instead of looking nice and continuous like that, has these random, random uh, phase jumps, right, which are distributed like this. Now, what happens with this case, right? We know that if you have a, if you have like a discontinuous profile in your function of time, Right, the Fourier spectrum has power at all frequencies, right? So basically, so for example, if you have a square wave and if you take the Fourier spectrum of this, right, the, the Fourier coefficients, uh, I think, are proportional to uh, n to the minus one, right? Because these are discontinuous, right? You still have like a, uh, a dominant variation corresponding to uh, this frequency, but you have power at, you know, you know, the, the power spectrum becomes broadened. Um, so, so, you know, basically the upshot is, you know, in fact, there is a homework problem on this, which you are asked to do uh, in the last homework problem set. Uh, <coughs> you're able to hear me, right? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, right. So, so what happens is if so this nice uh, so you know if this was nice delta function at some frequency uh, or a Lorenzian you know a, a thin Lorenzian basically. So this is at fr frequency nu naught. Now because of these jumps, what happens is it becomes broader and it develops tails. Uh, sorry, this is yeah. This should really, if this is normalized, then this will be very high. So the you know this becomes broadened due to these random uh, phase introduced by collisions. But the profile profile is Lorenzian. Uh, like, you know, natural broadening. All right. So, so Gaussian profile is obtained because of Doppler shift because the particle velocity distribution is Gaussian. Right. But these natural and collisional broadening mechanisms give Lorenzian profiles. And, you know, of course, if it's a Lorenzian profile, uh, phi nu is equal to gamma by 4 pi squared by nu minus nu naught squared plus gamma by 4 pi. The this is the same as what we had previously, except that tau, this damping term, is equal to gamma plus two times new collision frequency. Now this is natural uh, damping, right? This is radiation damping, damping. Whereas this is collision frequency. So typically this new uh, gamma will be much smaller than the collision rate for at least reasonably dense plasmas. So collisional broadening can be more, much more than natural uh, damp broadening due to natural damping. So there is a homework problem where this notion that because of this discontinuous phase jump, you obtain a power spectrum, right? So how do you get a how do you get a spectrum, right? You you do e you have e you know you have, you have e as a function of time. You go to E as a function of omega, and your power spectrum or or uh, intensity as a function of frequency is proportional to E omega uh, whole square. So you know there is a Fourier transform here, and as I said, because of this this jump in the signal, uh, right because you know there is an analogous effect that because of this jump in the discontinuous jump in the electric field you get broadening okay and this is sort of done in the homework problem so you should do that um, but you know the end result so basically what it does is it uh, it uses this gauss this poisson distribution of collision times and actually you know uh, looks at e is equal to e to the e naught e to the minus i omega t uh, minus gamma t this is na this is uh, natural damping uh, and then you have a this phase factor right and this this phase factor is a random variable which has this poisson distribution so what you have to do is you have to average over all the collisions so you 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 go from this so this is a random number basically. So you will, you have this, you go to E omega, uh, and then you do E omega squared and do an ensemble average so that you can average over this uh, PDF of collision times. Okay, and what the end, you know, in the end what you get is because of this discontinuity, you get uh, broadening with long tails. You know, these, this, this corresponds to tails. Right, you know, if, if you go to very large nu, nu minus nu naught, much bigger than gamma, what you get is phi nu goes like uh, 
mu minus nu naught to the minus two, which you know, which is a which sort of is resembles this, right? This is intensity, so it's a square of that. It was like one over the harmonic squared. So this is collisional broadening. Okay, now in reality, uh, so you know, combined, uh, combined Doppler and uh, sort of natural or collisional uh, broadening. Right. In reality, you have these atoms which have a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and they also undergo collisions with each other and there is natural broadening. So what do we get in this case? What happens to the line profile in this case? So the point is that you have these particles. They have some 1D uh, line of sight velocity distribution. Some particles are moving away, some are towards us and you know the distribution functions. So so line of sight velocity distribution is uh, you know is proportional to e to the minus v z square if z is the direction of line of sight by you know twice k b t right so particles with their which have very high velocities towards us or away from us are rare but most of them have like close to zero velocity, you know, comparable to the thermal velocity of the particles. Now what happens is each of these atoms will ha will not be delta functions. Their line lines will not be delta functions. They will have their own sort of Lorentzian profiles. And this will have its own Lorentzian profiles, but they are shifted, right? The new observed is equal to new naught times one plus V Z by C, right? This is a uh, Doppler shift, right? So this is the observed frequency. If nu naught is the, the central frequency of the transition and V Z is the velocity, the line of sight velocity of the particle, this is what the observer will see. So, uh, So your uh, observed, right? So if you have a velocity vz, this is the frequency at which your Lorentzian will be peaking, right? This is where an atom's uh, Lorentzian uh, profile peaks. So. Uh, so you have so you know this atom which is moving with velocity vz will give rise to you know phi by 4 pi squared uh, or sorry gamma by 4 pi squared nu minus nu naught 1 plus vz by c squared plus gamma by 4 pi the whole square right so this is the this is the uh, the lorentzian due to a particle which moves with velocity vz right but we the part the velocity there is a velocity distribution so this is for a given vz but we know that e to the minus m vz square by twice kbt dvz this is uh, uh, right, so this is the this is the, the this is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of velocities. So you have to sum up all the all these particles with different velocities to get the observed line profile. So this is phi nu. Now and your velocity is integrated from minus infinity to infinity. So basically what you're doing is you are adding up the Lorentzians 
adding up the Lorenzians by individual atoms and weighing them by uh, the Maxwell Boltzmann or distribution of uh, line of sight velocities. Okay, so right. So this is what we have to. So do you under you understand, right? All these individual Lorenzians are added up to obtain the the resultant line profile, and you can actually see that this uh, this is like a convolution. So let's call let's call this Lorenzian. Uh, uh, Let's call this function Lorenzian of nu naught comma gamma, right? This function phi nu, it's a function of the, the uh, central frequency and the uh, this damping factor, right? Which is related to full width half maximum of this line profile. So what is this? This factor. This is nothing but uh, Lorenzian of nu naught 1 plus vz by c comma gamma by 4 pi sorry gamma, comma gamma this 4 pi is included um, right so and this is nothing but a, uh, a gaussian with the velocity vz. <coughs> and you are basically doing this. OK, there was a little bit of a lag. OK, so this is sort of like a. Uh, just a second. Uh, right, so this is sort of like a. Uh, a convolution. Of uh, Lorenzian. And a Gaussian function. Right, so you have f x uh, times g x. Right, so so um, right, so this right, so this is v z, so d v z d v z. So the the uh, right, so we are integrating over v z. This is the integral integration variable. Um, so, so we can write it as actually uh, new minus new not uh, square, right? So new minus new not plus uh, new not v z by c squared. And uh, so we can actually divide it by nu naught and nu naught squared up outside. Right, so you know, uh, so this is just the denominator, denominator of that uh, in the Lorenzian. So now we can actually, uh, you know, Physically, you have to understand what we are doing, right? We are just adding up these Lorenzians from particles which have a Gaussian velocity distribution. So now we can actually mathematically, you know, simplify this. So we can <coughs> we can do a change of variable. And what is the change of variable? We introduce y is equal to square root of m by twice kt. Uh, times vz, 
right? So this becomes e to the minus y squared. So what do we get? We get, so this is y. Uh, and we also introduce another variable. Uh, so this is e to the minus y squared dy. <clears throat> right, so we can actually write this line profile, this phi nu, as actually h a comma u. Right, so in terms, you know, in terms of simpler uh, integrals. Just a sec. Um, so this is equal to. Um, a by pi. Let me just write it down and then let, I'll explain it minus infinity to infinity e to the minus y square. This is just this. This is just coming from that uh, dy divided by a squared plus u minus y the whole square. So this, uh, you know, you can actually see the correspondence. So y corresponds to vz, a corresponds to gamma by 4 pi, and u minus y is just this term, this one, uh, because there is this vz, right? So let me actually tell you what a is. a is equal to gamma by 4 pi delta nu d, um, and u is equal to nu minus nu naught by delta nu d. Right, so this is just, uh, right, this is, this is, this is related to u. Um, and this delta nu d, the Doppler width uh, of the line profile just due to, just due to Doppler broadening is equal to twice uh, kt kvt by m uh, times nu naught by c right so this we we talked about this uh, in the previous class so this profile this line profile uh, line this is called the voigt v o i g t line profile right which is a convolution of a, a gaussian and a, <coughs> excuse me lorenzi now you can actually see that this is the gaussian so this is uh, what is a convolution function Right, so uh, so if you have f x times g uh, uh, x minus a dx, this is the convolution function. Convolution of f and g is equal to this. So it does have that form, right? This is the the Gaussian, and this is the Lorentzian shifted by one, by u so you know this is the line profile this actually you know it, it's you it cannot you know it's not analytically doable uh, but you do have approximations of this uh, which are very widely used so line profile is very very uh, important uh, and it's commonly used uh, you know we get a lot of information from emission and absorption lines. So that's why uh, this line profiles and uh, to infer uh, physical quantities from the line properties is a very important area. OK, so let's let's try to get some insights on this void profile. 
right? So this is, you know, you are basically adding up the Lorenzians at the local velocity, uh, at the you know, uh, line of sight, across all the line of sight velocities that you have. Okay, so let's see. So suppose, you know, you have some uh, Gaussian distribution of uh, particles. So, you know, let's say, you know, this is sort of, let's say this is your the central frequency. So, you know, this is when where the gas is at rest. OK, so most of the particles will emit at nu naught and you have this long, you know, let me draw the Lorenzian with red. So you have this long tail. Right, corresponding to these particles, you know, and then you have this overall uh, thing which is Gaussian. So, you know, it's actually very sharply declining and goes to zero really uh, beyond. Uh, but it's actually broad. So suppose you have like a Gaussian like this. Right now. Uh, when you are looking close to the line center, right? Uh, or in the limit where in this, uh, for this function H, uh, your U is uh, much less than one, right? So basically, uh, nu minus nu naught is less than delta nu D. In that case, you know, the, the central profile, you know, you can actually approximate this by a delta function in that case. And then you just have, you know, uh, close to the line center, uh, you have a, uh, you basically have a Lorenzian, right? Let's see, how do we do that? Uh, so in this case, the line, you know, uh, mm. <clears throat> so, you know, close to line center, you are really Gaussian. Uh, Gaussian line profile. Right, so, uh, because, you know, clo close to, for nu minus nu naught, much less than delta nu d, basically this exponential suppression factor is not that important. And all you have is this, you know, you add up, you know, you add up. So, you know, basically you have certain width of this Gaussian and you have these uh, Lorenzians at, you know, these delta functions at all the local velocities. So, you know, they have the same height. So you add up and, you know, you get something which is close to the, you get an effective line profile, which is called close to the, uh, so, you know, phi nu is basically, uh, phi Doppler in this case, right? Or, or in other words, you can take uh, can take uh, you know gamma to be zero for these Lorenzians. Okay. Now, so this is when you are close to the uh, you know when you're close when you're when you're uh, uh, Delta nu is small compared to delta nu d. Now the other limit is this is the first limit. The other limit is uh, u much bigger than one, right? So basically, you, you know, so you're, you're looking uh, in the tail of uh, Gaussian distribution. Now in that case, uh, all these Lorenzians are totally suppressed. These are, you know, these the Lorenzians due to the particles which are in the tail of velocity distribution are totally suppressed by this exponential factor. So what do you get here? Uh, so what happens in this case is, uh, you know, you still get some intensity coming here, and that's that's because of this. Uh, that's because of the central atom, you know, central atoms which have zero line of sight velocity, but they have long tails right so this is due to uh, uh, due to atoms uh, with velocity 
<coughs> close to zero or basically uh, you know right so basically then you just have the lorenzian in this case so let's see in this integral this would correspond to uh, u much bigger than right so it will just be e to the minus y squared dy This is really you, yeah. So if uh, <clears throat> u minus y is much bigger than one. So this is this is for frequency much bigger than delta nu d. Uh, so or nu minus nu naught much bigger than delta nu d. Um, I think you can also mathematically show it, but uh, you know it's actually pretty straightforward to see it that you know uh, uh, <clears throat> the Gaussian the width of the Gaussian is so narrow that uh, you know th these part these atoms are totally suppressed, so only the central uh, central Lorenzian profile corresponding to the peak of the Gaussian will dominate in the tail. So tail uh, is due to uh, Lorenzian uh, center at uh, nu equals nu naught. OK, and this actually can also be done mathematically in terms of the properties of this integral. Um, <clears throat> I will not try to do that. So, you know, whenever you have, you know, uh, whenever we have uh, lines in uh, observations, you start, you know, fitting the line using a void profile. That's the first thing that you do. OK. And uh, <clears throat> right, so if you are in this, uh, and you know the 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 void profile. So just from knowing uh, if it is like if the line looks like a Gaussian, then you can from the observed width of uh, of the frequency uh, frequency width of the line you can actually get a sense of the thermal velocity, right? Because this is equal to twice kT by m by nu naught by c. So you know the line natural frequency. You have measured this in your spectrum. So you can get the temperature of uh, the emitting gas, emitting atoms. And this is very, very useful. OK, so you know, by modeling the spectra, you can get a lot of information from you know about the physical properties like the densities and velocities and so on. So what I will actually show you now are some you know are a few examples that I okay. Oops, got this one. Uh,
Um, let's see. Oh. Right, for example, this is, uh, you know, this is a very recent paper uh, which talks about measuring the, you know, these are X-ray, you know, this is an X-ray. So this is a like three, four years ago, paper from three, four years ago. And <clears throat> it shows the velocity measurement in the core of a galaxy cluster Perseus. OK, so. Uh, so let me actually just so, you know, this is this is the spectrum as a function of energy. This is an X-ray line that they are measuring. This is an iron line that they are trying to model. OK, so this is the observed spectrum and you see these lines. OK, and uh, I think this is the this is this complex here that you see. I, this is from 7.5 to 8.5. This is this region which has been sort of zoomed in uh, because this is like, you know, this is just amplified so that and this is a log scale. So you can actually see these lines here. So these are sort of fitted with the void profile. OK. So for example, here, this is from 6.5 to 6.6, .6, uh, 6.5 to 6.6. .6. You know, around this region, if you zoom in, this is how your data looks like. And this red is like fit to this data, which is shown with these points. And there are different components. Uh, and these are iron 25. So basically, uh, iron 24 plus, it's like helium like iron. And this is iron 26, which is Lyman alpha. Like, you know, it's a singly ionized iron. Yeah, sorry, it, it is an iron with single uh, electron. So it's it, so this transition is like the Lyman alpha transition. Right, and so these are the lines that you see. And since this is an iron atom, so uh, you recall that uh, the Doppler width delta nu d is nu naught times kt by m where m is the mass of the atom right because you know this this these iron highly ionized iron atoms or iron ions are producing these lines so that mass there in the one over square root of m corresponds to the mass of iron since mass of iron is very large compared to hydrogen Right, iron 56, 56, you know, A is 56. It's uh, its thermal velocity will be small, right? Because if you have the same temperature of the plasma, the more massive atoms uh, will be slower. You know, will have will have smaller particle velocities compared to stuff like hydrogen. Now, the the nice thing about that is. If your thermal velocity is small, most of your broadening is due to turbulent broadening, turbulent velocities. As I said, if the medium is turbulent, if there is a distribution of velocities due to random motion, then the two, the thermal velocity and the turbulent velocity add in quadrature, right? So the, the, the thermal velocities for hydrogen and iron atoms are different. But the turbulent velocities for them are the same because you know when a bulk of a of gas or a fluid element uh, fluid element of a gas is moving, all the atoms which constitute it move at the same velocity. So since the thermal velocity is small, uh, measuring this line, you know, the ability to measure this line uh, carefully can tell us the turbulent velocity of this medium. So you you see here. Uh, these the the black and the blue lines here the blue and black lines show instrumental broadening so blue line is instrumental broadening uh, and the black line is instrumental broadening without thermal broadening. So you see the this is you know this is the maximum this is the width. Uh, this is the minimum width that this instrument can measure. But you see the the red line here 
is well measured you know it, it its width is better than this so this is distinguishable from zero so by measuring this width of this uh, gaussian line they are able to get delta nu and from that delta nu they are able to get the velocity and this is what you get as the turbulent velocity so uh, so basically what it means is delta e by e right just a sec uh, yeah, is right here. So delta E, you know, the width. Uh, just, just think. Right. So this, this, this one. So the width in frequency, you know, uh, the spread in frequency is kT by m for thermal broadening. But if you have turbulent broadening, which dominates in this case, it's just this square root of kT by m is just v turbulent. So v turbulent by c is delta nu by nu, which is nothing but delta e by e, because you know here uh, frequency instead of frequency they are using energy, because these are this is an X-ray and that's what they prefer to use. So you can actually see, um, you know, how big is delta? You know, this width is like 6.55, 6. 6.6 uh, 6 is here. It's one, two, three, four, five. So it's 0 0.01. So 0, uh, this width is like, you know, of order 0 0.01 divided by 6.5. So 0 0.01 by 6.5 is V by C, a tur turbulent velocity by C. And that, you know, doing that more carefully gives you this turbulent velocity. Is this clear? Hello. Is this clear somewhat, right? So basically, this is an application of how you apply uh, this uh, Doppler broadening of the line in practice. And actually, this is an X-ray. So this is done by this Hitomi uh, spacecraft, which was unfortunately lost only after doing one or two, you know, only after a few months. So this was so they are following it up and there will be another successor of this uh, launched in 2022. This is the Japanese uh, satellite. Um, so, you know, getting very high spectral resolution in X-rays is very hard. And this is what was the big achievement of this experiment was. Uh, any question? Okay, so let me ask a question then. Uh, now, can can what is the so my claim is that this exercise cannot be done with say hydrogen atom, and can you say tell me why why can't you get the the sigma v, the turbulent velocity from hydrogen atom? Sir, so because uh, its total uh, velocity will be uh, uh, like a combination of its turbulent velocity and thermal velocity, and its thermal velocity is not negligible as in case of yes, iron. Absolutely. Uh, so basically, hydrogen being 50 times, 56 times less massive, its thermal velocity will be much larger than the turbulent velocity of the medium. So that's why iron line is a good one because it's it has a lot of high mass. So its thermal velocity is small. So you can directly measure the turbulent velocity. Good. That was that was good. So at least someone is understanding. Uh, okay. So some other examples. Uh, let's see. Uh, emission and absorption lines. Uh, right. So here are some spectra for stars. So this is spectrum and O5 star. O stars are very massive. They have like few tens of thousand Kelvin photospheric temperature. And most of these stars show absorption lines. Stars show absorption lines. For example, this A star, I think these are Balmer lines, you know, uh, 450 are these. 
this perhaps is H alpha, I don't know, this one. Uh, 6,006. Right, so, so, you know, all these stars have characteristic absorption lines and the more massive, you know, stars have uh, lines corresponding to uh, highly ionized things like helium-2, right? It's singly ionized helium, so it's hydrogen-like helium, so uh, which are excite which is excited by the hotter gas that you have. So here in O star, which is at few tens of thousand Kelvin, all the hydrogen is mostly ionized. So you don't really see very strong hydrogen absorption features, but you see strong singly ionized helium absorption features. So this is o, o star, B star. So in this, so you can also see the background continuum. See this peaks at in UV, O5 spectrum, which peaks at UV, it's not even sort of showing this high. It does not show the vein tail in this part. In contrast, this is like a M star and it, it's thermal spectrum, the background continuum peaks in, in infrared. Right? And this is our sun. Uh, it, it sort of peaks in optical. Uh, so, you know, the important thing is it has narrow, it, it has these absorption lines that my, my uh, you know, these stars, O, B, A, F, G, these classifications are actually based on these spectra because these spectra are sort of somewhat easy to obtain. And you just say, if your if your star shows a lot of uh, UV absorption lines, and which looks like this, this is an O star and a B star and so on. Here, this is a low mass star. So it shows molecular features like titanium oxide. So these are bands, molecular bands instead of lines. If you have molecules, they show bands instead of very narrow lines. Okay, uh, yeah, so these are the standard transitions of hydrogen that you mostly see here. This, right, so this is like a uh, 30 Doradus nebula uh, excited by O stars. So this is a nebula, so, you know, gas cloud, uh, and there are massive O stars here in the center. This is an HST image, I think, of 30 Doradus. This is a region in uh, Magellanic, large Magellanic clouds in one of our dwarf satellite galaxies. Okay, so, uh, so this is the spectrum, which is very different from this spectrum. So can someone tell me what is the fundamental difference between this spectrum and the spectra on the left? Uh, we, we see a lot of emission lines. That's correct. So instead of absorption lines, you see emission lines. So, you know, we did this radiative transfer. When do we see emission and when do we see absorption, right? We see absorption when the background is bright and you have some cooler thing in the foreground which absorbs that background light. Like in case of stars, right? Stars, photosphere, is hot, but it has an atmosphere which is somewhat cooler and it absorbs, right? Whereas the corona of a star, you know, if you have a solar eclipse, you are able to see coronal emission lines, which are much more like this, because during an eclipse, you're not seeing the, the background uh, strong emission, which is absorbed by the photospheric uh, lines, but you see the coronal lines which are, uh, which are in emission. Here, this is nebular emission, okay? And it's because of excitation of uh, these atoms around it by this strong stellar radiation that you see these emission lines from such a planetary nebula. This is not this, is not this same nebula. This is from a planetary nebula, which is again a nebula, but it's around a, uh, it's around a young white dwarf uh, you know, when a white, when a, when a sun-like star ends its life, 
the central core forms a white dwarf and it's still surrounded by gas and uh, clouds. So this this so this white dwarf is very very hot but very small. So this hot radiation excites the surrounding cooler gas and it uh, once these levels are excited they when they de excite there is a emission of photons. OK, and that's what you see here. So these are emission lines. So the width of these emission lines can give you a sense of thermal velocity of this uh, medium. Here is again another spectrum from a quasar. And here also you see strong emission lines. So emission lines mean that you have optically thin uh, gas, uh, which is not, you know, which, which is emitting and it's somehow excited by something, by collisions or by uh, background stellar light. And you can actually see very standard lines here, like oxygen six and forbidden lines, you know, H beta, H gamma, H delta. These are Balmer series lines, right? 4861, 4340, 4101, and so on. But you also have these oxygen uh, doublet here. So, the, you know, people who do, uh, who, you know, this is a this is a, a big field in itself, modeling the line emission. Uh, you have to carefully subtract the continuum. Okay. And this is Lyman Alpha 1216. You see this very prominent peak. So, be, you know, if you show this to experts, they can very easily tell that this is a quasar and this is a planetary nebula and these are stars. Okay. Because, you know, we have dealt with spectra for a long time. Okay. So, now spectroscopy is extremely important, right? As you realize, we cannot go to a star and get material and analyze what it contains, right? We get a lot of information from these spectra that we get remotely. And, you know, before the discovery of spectroscopy uh, in 1800s, people thought that we'll never be able to learn about stars because they are simply so far away. Okay. But the discovery of spectroscopy by uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff and so on uh, told us that you don't have to get the material in order to understand what the, the what it is composed of. Every atom and ion has a has a signature lines has signature lines. And by measuring those lines, you can infer the presence of those atoms and molecules. So this is really a very, very big uh, discovery. And of course, you know, this this shows these splittings that I briefly talked about. So this is n equal to one and n equal to two hydrogen line. And then there is due to LS coupling because of this uh, interaction of orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, which can be thought of as uh, interaction of magnetic fields uh, in the electron rest frame and the spin of the electron ls coupling you these these principal levels get split okay uh, and the ordering here is alpha square z to the 4 as i mentioned in the last class so these are these are like smaller compared to this gap uh, and then there is a further splitting due to the coupling between the electronic spin and the spin of the nucleus, and these are called hyperfine splittings. So these are some of the common lines, like Balmer lines are these transitions. For example, n equal to three to two. Carbon two forbidden line at 158 microns is a is a common fine structure line. So transitions like this. And then 21 centimeter is a hyperfine transition. OK. Um, so this is actually an example of quasar. So quasars are these very bright sources, black you know, powered by black hole accretion. So you see uh, this is a 3C273, one of the early quasars discovered, which is at a redshift of 0.16. OK. Now, how do we know the can someone tell me how we know the redshift of this quasar? 
how you know can you guess how we would know this redshift just from this given spectrum so let me actually go to the previous slide this is a quasar spectrum and the x axis is rest wavelength okay so what this shows are these in, important lines you see there is a very prominent 1216 angstrom line and there is like a break on the left of it so you try to see that this line here is the that lyman alpha and there is this break on the left of it so this is its rest wavelength is 1216 and this is uh, i think this is the emitted wavelength so but you know the observed wavelength will be at 1 plus z times 1216 so by seeing these different features in the spectrum one can actually tell what the redshift of the quasar is here this is a redshift 3.62 quasar but the x axis is emitted wavelength not the observed wavelength the observed wavelength will be shifted by a factor of 4.62 towards the red right that's how uh, the redshift is defined uh, new observed by new emitted is equal to 1 plus z i mean can someone you know what is the difference between can you see a difference between the spectrum of this quasar and this quasar what is the most noticeable difference between this and this the line is more squiggly for lower wavelength in the second one yes in the lower in the, at higher redshift quasar shows a lot of uh, absorption troughs right you see a lot of you know breaks here a lot of absorption troughs although this guy also shows a single broad absorption and a little bit of absorption here and there so what it means is that the farther you go the farther the quasar is it encounters a lot of cool gas cold clouds which can actually absorb this emission right and gives rise to these uh, uh, absorption features so this is called lyman alpha forest this sort of looks like a forest of lines right you know you have these absorptions the the closer the quasar are, quasar is the absorption is smaller and smaller uh, but you can have such things so this would actually perhaps correspond to some foreground galaxy uh, which is in the line of sight of this quasar and it absorbs the quasar radiation so we can you know by by seeing this absorption we can actually also tell uh, where this at what redshift this uh, galaxy is located so this this is actually a very very important area of astrophysics uh, quasar absorption line studies okay, okay so, so would there, there be yes. a lower energy cutoff <coughs> what is what a lower wavelength cutoff for for the forest what is the lower wavelength cutoff because uh, i mean uh, if it's a lyman alpha forest then at z is equal to 1 we should have a cutoff right at z is equal to zero i mean right see here the left hand side the cut off here in the uv is just because of our telescopes right you know thousand angstrom is in ultraviolet we don't we don't really have anything which can really observe in few hundred uh, angstrom this is about the limit of the telescopes that we have on ground ultraviolet is anyway absorbed uh, by the atmosphere so uh you know to go to 900 800 you have to be in space so the hubble space telescope has a uv spectrograph called cos cosmic origin spectrograph you know it gives a little bit here but the left part so basically what this is the idea right you have a photon so you know most of the uh most of the clouds uh have significant neutral hydrogen right if you have neutral hydrogen on the line of path, in in the path then if it's uh, if the frequency of the background photons uh, is larger than uh, 1 to 1 6 uh, angstrom corresponding to this 
n equal to 1 to 2 transition or the Lyman alpha transition, all the foreground uh, hydrogen atoms which are in the in their lowest state will get excited and will absorb the background radiation. So that is what is actually happening here. This is hydrogen absorption. Most of these are hydrogen absorption due to intervening uh, clouds. OK. So by modeling this, we can actually tell that, oh, there is a cloud at this redshift. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, my, my question was uh, that there would be a closest galaxy to uh, uh, the closest galaxy in the line of sight would uh -huh. be roughly z is equal to zero. Yeah, and that would have an uh, emit uh, that would have an absorbed wavelength of uh, Lyman alpha that is one to yes, what? right? So, but this is you remember this is emitted wavelength. Yes, sir. In fact, so the ease, you know, for example, this 1000 here would actually go to 1000 times uh, 1400, 4.62, 4, 4,600, 4, yeah, 4,620. So this, this light is not, you know, an N equal to one hydrogen atom in the nearby universe cannot absorb 4000 angstrom because it's in the ground state, it's in the N equal to one state. It cannot be kicked up to n equal to two state uh, unless the photon energy is greater than one to one six angstrom, you know, or lambda is less than that. You see, right. so that's the idea, basically, that you know, hydrogen can absorb uh, lambda less than less than one to one six angstrom. OK, so you know th these are all like examples of spectroscopy. There's such an important role of spectroscopy. So the other thing is uh, we there are also metal absorption features. You know, you have metal absorption features and by comparing various metals and metals with hydrogen uh, uh, features, we can actually tell something about the composition of this uh, emitting region. So by comparing various lines, we can tell the density, temperature, velocity, uh, and so on of the emitting region. So it's very, very powerful. Modeling of the lines is very powerful. So here on the right is what it is showing is something called curve of growth modeling. OK, so this is, you know, this is modeling of an absorption line. For example, here you can pick some absorption line, for example, this one. Or, for example, this one right here at 1050. So, how does one model such lines, absorption lines? Uh, if you have a continuum, so you subtract the continuum and you just get the line profile. So, this is showing a relative flux. So, basically, if there was a continuum which was like this, and then this is extra absorption due to the line. So, this is a relative function, re relative flux as a function of velocity. So zero velocity corresponds to the rest frequency, right? It corresponds to the frequency uh, peak of the Lorenzian profile, of the white profile, actually. So you see when, uh, so, so this, these are the all possible absorption features that you can imagine. So this, for example, this feature is very uh, small, right? So it's sort of something like, uh, you know, this feature or this feature or something like this. OK, so if you have this small feature, that means that absorption uh, even at the line center is optically thin because it is only removed a small fraction of the flux of the background flux, right? We know that if you have a background intensity I and if it passes through some absorbing medium, I that passes through is just e to the minus tau nu. Uh, so this is this is if the so e to, if e to the minus tau nu is small, uh, that means tau nu is small. So uh, so the the dip is basically proportional to tau nu.
Right. So in this regime, the dip is actually proportional to tau nu. So this is optically thin. Now, as the uh, column of the absorber increases, <coughs> the dip, de the depth of this absorption feature increases. Okay. So these lines here, which are not, these are called unsaturated. But once you know the line center is saturated, that means at the line center there is no flux. So, for example, this is an example in which the line center is almost saturated. Although you see this emission feature at that left shift, this is not as clean. But for example, this one here, it's almost like saturated in its core. So there is no light coming out. So this is the saturated part. And if your column density becomes even more, what you get is something like this one. Right, you see these tails, these correspond to the Lorenzian tails actually. You see these, uh, this absorption profile or this one or this one. This is called the saturated, uh, this is called the, the uh, you know, when the photons start coming in the tail, start, you know, start absorbing in the tail. So the, the opacity is so high that the center is totally absorbed, but in the tail, your phi nu is dominated by the Lorenzian. So you can actually see that Lorenzian um, here in the uh, high velocities. So this is what you uh, what you expect uh, depending on how much column absorbing column you have. So th this this depth of this line is quantified by something called uh, W or an equivalent width. So basically what you're saying is that this you are approximating by like a square of height one, right? So you basically how, how narrow will the square be in order to block the same amount of light, right? So if you have this uh, dip, so you will need some square like this, right? Which will, which will block the same amount of light. Uh, so, the equivalent width of this one is small, followed by this, 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 and this. So this is equivalent width on the y-axis. This is some quantification of strength of absorption due to this uh, line feature. So this is uh, equivalent width on the y-axis, which quantifies the strength of absorption, and the x-axis is the column density. So when the line is not saturated, the two are linearly proportional. So this is the proportionality. This is linearly, so the equivalent width is proportional to the column density. Now, when the full, the, when the line becomes saturated, right, the, I mean, if you, you, you approximate this as a square, what you have is, uh, uh, that you have almost full transmission and zero transmission. And the width of this, uh, in that case, uh, is, you know, th this is the width. And in this regime, this width is, the equivalent width is very insensitive to the column density or to the optical depth. This is called the flat portion of the curve of growth. So this relation between, uh, equivalent width and column density is called curve of growth. This is the linear portion of the curve of growth. This is the flat portion of the curve of growth. And this is when this corresponds to these when you have these Lorenzian tails. In this case, the width of the Lorenzian uh, is given as square root of the column density. So this, this portion goes like uh, y equals square root of x this portion goes like y equals x, y proportional to x, and this is like, you know, very weakly sensitive. Y is very weakly dependent on x. So this is what you measure from modeling the line. So this is what you measure. And what you're after is like a column density. So if you measure something like this, you can infer that, oh, this is my column density. If you measure something like this, you can infer the column density. But if you are in this flat portion, right, there, since this is flat, 
even a small error here can give you a big error in NH1. So the flat portion of curve of growth is not that useful for measuring the column density. So, you know, this is all the magic of spectral lines. They give us so much information. So here, for example, these different lines here correspond to different thermal velocities. So if you have a large thermal velocity, then the then the if you have large thermal velocity like this dot dash line, then the line centered uh, line profile uh, or phi at the line center is small. So absorption is small. So this optically thin scaling sort of continues for a larger column density. And then it flattens later on. So this is like a very sophisticated area. There are codes available which can, you know, if you give you give if you give your uh, profile or give your spectrum, it can actually return to you the equivalent width and the column and whatnot. So here is actually an example. So this is what. Yeah, this is an example for uh, hydrogen column density of 10 to the 13 uh, per centimeter square. And these are different velocities, right? So if you have a narrow velocity distribution like 13 kilometer per second, your line center, uh, Lorenzian value at the line center is larger and you have a sharper uh, absorption. Whereas if you have a broader velocity distribution of the atoms, this is sort of broader. Again, this is for this is when you're you're unsaturated. This is when you're saturated and you have this radiation coming out in the tails of the line or uh, radiation absorbed in the tails of the lines. So this is higher velocity. And this is lower velocity. So, you know, this is just to give you a flavor uh, of what's possible with modeling of the lines. OK, you can get temperature density and whatnot. So this is a very important area. OK, so this is about it. Um, OK, so I think we have come to the end of the course and the class. And now we have to decide about the time, exam time. So I'll actually stop recording. Uh,